uh, René Girard would draw the distinction between Christianity proper and hyper-Christianity, which seizes upon, and, and this was Girard's, the point you just made, as far as I understand it, was extremely close to, if not ex exactly the same point that René Girard was making, which is that hyper-Christianity is actually quite dangerous. There's a notion of egalitarianism in Christianity. The communists take that and take that value and blow it up and lose the sense of proportion, lose the, lose the larger it context of values. It becomes a secularized yes. form of religion so, that so, has so no So Douglas no writes in The War of the West, as Christianity has withdrawn, so one new religion in particular has found its way into the cultural mainstream. It is the new religion of anti-racism. With other grand narratives collapsed, the religion of anti-racism fills people with purpose and a sense of meaning. To eliminate Christian belief, how to put this? We cannot go back to a pre-Christian world. That at a minimum is, uh, uh, Tom's point is that at a, yes. at a very well, minimum. Well, right? we can though, we've, and we've tried it in, in, certainly in Europe with mm. fascism. Fascism was on one level deeply, you know, it was fascinated by the future. It was fascinated by tanks and airplanes and shiny new equipment, but it was also deeply back looking. There was a conscious effort to go back to the pre-Christian well, world. Yes. So Mussolini is identifying Which, with, with, with Augustus and Hitler, actually unlike Himmler, Hitler was, was, was very much identified with both the Greek, the classical Greeks and the Romans. He saw them as, as, as Aryans. And Freud, 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 Freud made that statement that, that the Nazis were not, were, were some kind of harkening back to the, tr to the folk, sure, the pagan yes. past, well, yes? Yeah, and, and by the way, I'd just add one other thing to that, um, which is what, what the, a point that David Berlinsky's made in, in, a, in a book, that actually, you know, if you look back at the 20th century, what is, what is the one thing that the, the murderers, the gangs of Pol Pot, and Hitler, and Stalin, and every other despot of the 20th century, what's the one thing they all had in common? None of them thought that God was watching. But, Douglas, I, I, I would distinguish the Nazis from those inspired by communist ideology. Yeah. Communist sure. ideology bears the DNA of Christianity. That was millennial. Yes. Yeah, yeah, kind of because it's all yeah. about the last to be first, the first to yeah. be last. Yes, yes, you know, yes, Dives yes. and Lazarus, right. it's all that. It's a the secularized thing about, form of Christianity that, yeah. that denies yeah. that God is watching and with, with all deep, things are, are With lawful. a deep strain yeah. of the apocalyptic, yeah. this idea yeah. that the world can be born again, yeah. uh, that New Jerusalem can be born. Mm -hmm. The thing about the Nazis is that unlike the French or the Russian revolutionaries or the Chinese revolution, well, I'm, the French and the Russian revolutionaries who were, who were bred of the matrix of a Christian society, unlike them, the Nazis consciously repudiate not just institutional Christianity, but the fundamental values of Christianity. Right. And they, right. Right. you know, Paul says there is no Jew or Greek. The, the idea of a kind of universal human dignity is fundamental to Christian ideology. They reject As that. As to Marx, but not to the Nazis. Yeah, right. but uh, and also the other the other core one, of course, that they reject is, you know, I said that the, the the image of the cross symbolizes the idea that the the tortured triumphs over the torturer. That is not what the Nazis believe. No. The Nazis believe that the strong should crush down the weak, mm -hmm. and they do it for, for for the Nazis do it not because they want to be wicked or evil. They do it because they think that is what is morally justified. If if I could make a couple of points, quickly, one thing is it's noticeable that we've devolved onto the discussion of the Nazis, but there's a reason, which is that we also live still in the shadow of that. We certainly do. And, and Europe, where we're currently sitting, lives under a previous shadow as well. When Pope Benedict visited England, my friend Rabbi Jonathan Sachs uh, gave an address to Pope Benedict, in which he said something very important. He said, the peoples of Europe didn't lose faith in God just simply because they lost faith in God in the idea of the peoples of God being able to get on with each other. Europe, as people know, in the 16th century was a, a hellish demonstration of the fact that religion brought war, brought turmoil to society. In the 20th century, we have to work out how we have God after this, and we're still working that out. We we're nowhere near a conclusion if we could ever get to one. But it's, 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 it's interesting that everything must always be polluted by it because it's another one of the reasons why the peoples of Europe and the peoples of the Christian world moved away from God. That's so, such an interesting observation, Douglas, because in essence he's saying that we, we've lost faith in God because we've become disillusioned with ourselves. 
Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there was an interesting piece in the New York Times a couple of summers ago by Ross Douthat, the very uh, thoughtful columnist there, who is also, uh, I think, a Catholic uh, b believer. Mm -hmm. And he was raising the question, and it's the same question I'd like to raise, which is, on and given the human failures and the, and the wars of the last century, um, is it yet still possible to rethink the God question? Because we didn't reject God because of a lack of evidence for the reality of God in creation or in our world. There's an, there is a, rather in, instead an intellect, there's an intellectual antecedent. There's the, the, the Enlightenment in the 18th and 19th century. There's the 19th century scientific materialism. But then there's also this background of, of uh, the, the human nature problem expressed in the religious wars. But if we look at the evidence itself... Um, Historical or scientific? I mean scientific evidence. Right, right. And, I, and I also think there's been a great shift in philosophy away from, you know, there were these, these very facile disproofs of the possibility of the miraculous by people like David Hume and the Enlightenment. I think those are, you know, most philosophers regard those as, as very weak arguments indeed. But um, I think the scientific evidence, to me, I, I had a long, myself, tortu tortuous uh, religious conversion. It took about seven years. It was anything but a Damascus Road experience. You know, I overthought everything, but finally settled. And, um, and it was soon after that that I began to encounter uh, these scientists at major meetings who were themselves having intellectual conversions to some form of theism and later even to, to Christianity. Alan Sandage, a notable figure, a great, uh, longtime Jewish agnostic cosmologist whom I heard speak early in my scientific career, and he shocked the audience by explaining how he had come to a belief in God, not in, not in spite of the scientific work that he did, but in large part because of it. He was one of the scientists who was documenting the expansion of the universe. And Douthat in this piece in the New York Times two summers ago said, you know, look, in light of some of these developments, he was talking about, he, what the one he, he cited was the, the fine-tuning argument that the physicists are talking about, that the universe not only had a beginning, but it's been finely tuned against all odds and for no underlying physical reason to allow for the possibility of life. And some of these developments intellectually, I think, ought to cause us perhaps to rethink that default materialism or atheism that we all inherited okay. out of the so 19th now, century. Now we have two modes of thought taking place here, as far as I can tell. You're, re you're talking about the evidence, the scientific evidence. I don't know what, how, how you respond to that, but this I'm, not a, I'm a layman. That strikes me as very compelling. That has to be taken into account. That new evidence can no more be unknown or undiscovered than can, mode of thought number two, just a moment. Remember the trenches in the First World War? Those were Christian nations. That was pre-Nazi. Those were all Christian nations engaging in slaughter of each other on an astonishing, massive oh, scale. That's a huge question. Where were the statesmen so, to stop that? Where, where was God? It, it was, where was God? These are, it, these are things yeah, that also the history yes. cannot be unexperienced yeah, or unlived either. It wasn't either. just the Second World War. I mean, the Christian faith for many people died in the Somme. Um, but, but I think that something has to be observed here which is, of what Stephen says, which is that if, if you're a person of faith, let alone a person of the Christian faith, whenever a new discovery comes up, you will want it to bolster the argument you have. Now, the problem by, I can say is that many atheists will take the same line, or, albeit the opposite way, which was that they will hope that it will bolster their case. My own view, of course, remains we just don't know. And it seems to me that Christians will want the answers to be Christianity. Atheists will want it to be atheism. But the, the mode that our own age should try to be in should be to simply be open to these questions. I, I completely so, agree. So, hold on, hold on. I'm going to reassert control and, and get... It's the first question. Nope, no, no, no. It'll get more interesting. Excellent. So to, to take this, here's what I'd like to know. What I'd like to pursue next is, what do we need? You know, once again, just a fascinating interplay between these three men, you know, talking about how is it that has shaped the lives of humanity? How is it that has shaped their own personal lives? And where Tom Holland and I would argue Douglas Murray go at it from perhaps the atheistic agnostic side, uh, especially, um, you know, Douglas Murray 
talking about that, you know, he just doesn't really know. So he basically is sort of straddling the fence on this and basically putting it out there. He's not sure. He doesn't know. Is there a God? Is there not a God? Faith, no faith. Which is the right religion? What's right? What's wrong? You know, Douglas Bay says no. Holland, on the, I mean, Stephen Meyer, on the other hand, he basically says that he came through it through a long, arduous battle through scientific reasoning, utilizing a lot of the writings, a lot of the lectures that he attended from his peers and colleagues, in which they basically said the same thing, that they came to their religious convictions not in spite of science, but because of science. And my own personal view is the same way, very religious. I'm, I am religious. I do believe there's a God. I do believe there's a hereafter. I do believe there's good and evil. And I also believe that the science, that the world around us is showing us that there is some type of a creator, a single solitary being who is in control of all of this. Now, yes, I take it on faith, but then I also take it on logic. How is it that so many things are being controlled so precisely, mathematically? Just take a look at the human body. Look at our speech. We're looking at each other through our eyes. They can't even make anything close to the human eye. Scientists. Our DNA structure our skeletal tissues, our muscles, our fingers, what we can do with this, what we can do with our brain, what we can do with our ears. Everything is concise, precise. To me, it's just illogical that this just sort of, you know, it's just, it's just out there. No control, no one's in control. It's just, you know, an explosion occurred and human beings, poof, here we are. I just, that to me is illogical. And what these men are basically trying to say is going a little deeper, they were saying that what was it that shaped the world? Was it these leaders, whether they were good leaders or bad leaders or evil leaders, despicable despots like Hitler and Che and Stalin and Genghis Khan, and Paul, Paul, all of these, all of these despots. But then again, you take a look and you see from the religious side, and, and these, some of the other despots were quite religious. And some weren't. But take a look at what religion did. How many wars were fought over religion? How many lives were killed because of religion? Because people decided to speak up and against religious dogma, religious conviction. All of these things were occurring. How many wars have started because of religion? How many conquests began in the name of religion? You had Christian kings, Christian popes, you had Muslim leaders, Muslim sultans. Some were very good. Some were absolutely terrible. Some were wicked. Some were good and very gentle with their people and others, and others were absolute evil despots. So it just doesn't matter, folks, whether you're coming from a religious side or a non-religious side, atheist, agnostic, human beings will be human beings. And unfortunately, the majority are good, moral, decent people. They may be religious, they may not be but it doesn't take a whole lot to cause a lot of death, a lot of destruction, and a lot of suffering, whether you're religious or you're not religious. Anyways, folks, we appreciate you taking the time to watch. You've been watching the Dr. Nasser Shake Show. I'm your host, Dr. Nasser. If you've done so already, we'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, like, share, and follow us. Let us know what you think in the comments below. Take a look at our video links above and below. My final thought is always, when you're right, you're right, and when you're left, you're wrong. Until next time, folks, take care and stay safe.